We acknowledge, I mean, now we're beginning to acknowledge the role that Islam is playing in, in uh, uh, Muslim terrorism. Uh, but uh, even that has been very slow to come. I mean, it's, it has been obvious for many, many years, long before September 11th, that a certain style of, of uh, uh, Muslim infatuation was leading to this kind of uh, jihadi behavior. Um, we're, we, because of the respect we accord religious faith, we're very slow to, to acknowledge its, its causal role in, in conflict. Well, I think the biggest challenge as a matter of uh, discourse and, and debate uh, and the, certainly the most frustrating challenge is, is, is what comes from otherwise secular and even non-believing people who are just reluctant to admit how much mad work is being done because of religion in this world. I mean, they, they either can't believe that people really believe this stuff. You know, so when a suicide bomber blows himself up in, in a crowd of children, um, this secular type of person will imagine that wasn't religion. I mean, it was not, had, had nothing to do with a belief in paradise and 72 virgins. Who could believe that? I mean, this is, this is a, some kind of psychological aberration or it's a, it's a caused by economic desperation or our policies in the region. I mean, it's not a matter of metaphysical beliefs. Um, I think the, the jury is in on this. I mean, we know that, that people really do believe these things. They are telling us ad nauseum they believe these things. And I don't think there's any more powerful rhetorical device uh, for emphasis than blowing yourself up or, or, or flying a plane into a building. I mean, these people are really willing to die uh, for what they uh, believe. And we know it's not a matter of, I mean, to speak specifically about the Muslim world for a moment, we know it's not a matter of economics and, and education because, you know, in this recent plot in, in the UK, these are all doctors who are, who are aspiring suicide bombers. I mean, how, you know, how much more education did these doctors need? One was a neurosurgeon. You know, you, you find me a neurosurgeon suicide bomber, and you tell me the problem is education and economics. It's, it, it clearly isn't. And um, the, the deeper problem, and I think a far more sinister problem, is that it is possible to be well-educated, so well-educated that you can be a neurosurgeon and still believe that you can get 72 virgins in paradise. And this is made possible by the fact that we have allowed a certain mode of thought, religion, to thrive in, 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 a, in a, uh, a cocoon of, of this, this sphere of protection from criticism. It is just taboo to criticize people's religious beliefs. Say that I'm an optimist. I, you know, it's, I see that uh, this our emotional attachment to these myths is so well subscribed and so deep, um, and the belief even people who are not religious believe that everyone else needs to be religious. I mean, it's like you know, I don't I don't need it, but I mean, it's like the ultimate condescending attitude. But everyone else does. I mean, this is a, a myth that that is also widely subscribed even among atheists. Um, so the, the inertia in the system around, around really just having an honest conversation about what uh, it's reasonable to believe and what religion is doing in the world uh, is profound. And so I'm, I, I'm certainly not optimistic, um, but I don't know what else to do. And, and, and I see how, how tissue thin these, these beliefs actually are. I mean, they really are. It, it would be so easy to just unburden ourselves of all of this mythology. I mean, it, you know, it, it would be accomplished in a single generation if we just taught our children reasonably about the Bible's place in literature. You know, the Bible is not science, uh, and it's not particularly good philosophy, but it is literature. Let's, let's, let's read the Bible, and then let's read all these other books about dead gods, like the, you know, Ovid's Metamorphoses. Um, if we taught the Bible in, and the Quran in, in that way, in a single generation, the, the God of Abraham would take his place alongside Zeus and Poseidon and Apollo and the other dead gods, and, we, and none of this would be a problem. Um, but that, is that likely to happen? I think not.
think we, it's really just a matter of conversation and uh, releasing the, these taboos uh, that prevent us from uh, applying pressure to people's religious beliefs. I mean, particularly at the level of politics, you know, we have this um, this recent Republican debate where three presidents or, or um, candidates for the presidency of the United States raise their hands to testify that they don't believe in evolution. Okay, and there's no follow-up question. I mean, there's no penalty paid by these guys endorsing the starkest ignorance about uh, the state of our knowledge about biology. Um, and then, even, no, worse than that, the New York Times publishes a, def a further defense of intelligent design by one of these candidates, Sam, Sam Brownback, um, the we a week later. This has to change. I mean, there has to be a price paid for being, I mean, you know, if, if one of the candidates said that he thought the earth was flat, you know, that would be, you know, that would be synonymous with mental illness in that country. We would just be worried about his health at that point, and, and, and his, his political life essentially would be over. Um, I think the same kind of, I mean, th there's a reason why people who are certain that Elvis is still alive uh, don't get promoted to positions of great power and responsibility in our society. And it's not like we've passed a law against Elvis worship. You know, we haven't, we, we just uh, cease to take these people seriously. And I think we have to cease to take people's uh, religious certainties, you know, metaphysical certainties, certainties about the divine origin of certain books seriously. Uh, and that, that can happen very, very quickly. Um, and I think we should not be... Uh, I don't think we should doubt that a, a, a sea change in our discourse is possible because it clearly is on matter. Look how racism has undergone a, a has fallen into disrepute in the last 40 years. Um, I mean, we, it's, you know, the, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, there were editorials in, in the New York Times and the Los Angeles Times that were starkly racist by by today's standards. You know, we have made real progress in a very short span, and I think we could make the same kind of progress in talking about uh, you know, religion. It's just, you know, whether we're likely to do that, I don't know. Well, it's it's an elusive thing to uh, uh, get a hold of. I, th I think the, the absence of neurosis, the absence of fear, the absence of anxiety, uh, when you recognize what consciousness is like when those states of mind have subsided, uh, it, it seems to me intrinsically happy. It's intrinsically at ease. It's, it's intrinsically peaceful and... Um, I mean, at times even blissful. I mean, it's just it's the lack of complication, just merely being aware of oneself uh, in the present moment and not um, uh, continually being in conversation with, with, with oneself about the present moment. I mean, just thinking, 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 you know, incessantly. When that can subside, either because you're meditating or because you're enjoying yourself so much in, you know, in sport or, you know, you're having sex. I mean, any peak experience has this feature of, of having your attention really uh, uh, um, focused in, in a very uncomplicated way uh, on your experience in the present. And so that, that state of mind is, is uh, what I would call happiness. And, and all of the obstacles to being at rest in that in that state of mind, I, I would I think of as the obstacles to happiness, and those are things like, you know, a neurotic self-absorption with how other people perceive you, or you know, anxiety about the future, or regret about the thing you didn't say, uh, you know, yesterday. I mean, all of those those are the way those are the modes of thought that keep us from recognizing that it's possible to actually be really at ease in the present and and happy with with. Happy before anything happens. I mean, to have a happiness that's not contingent upon the next good thing that's going to happen, but have just to actually be at rest with what is happening right now. Mm -hmm.